Welcome back to the International Colloquium 100 Years That Shook the World Emancipatory Hypothesis. Um, our afternoon panel is entitled Democracy and Challenges for the 21st Century. And we have the pleasure of hosting two of our other international speakers of the day, who I deeply thank for having done a very long trip from India and um, Ethiopia, respectively, um, in order to join us in this very crucial um, debate on the legacies of the Russian Revolution. We will uh, follow the order of the printed schedule, so it is my absolute uh, pleasure to introduce you to our first speaker, Kamal Mitra Shanoi, on my left-hand side. Kamal Shanoi is both an academic and an activist. He is professor in the Center for Comparative <coughs> Politics and Political Theory at the School of International Studies of Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. Um, he was also a visiting scholar at Columbia University in New York. Um, Kamal combines his academic work with his citizen participation. He is a well-known activist in civil society issues, was one of the organizers of the World Social Forum in Mumbai in 2004 and in many other such events. He is also a member of the Indian Communist Party since 1973. He is a founding member of Coalition for Nuclear Disarmament and Peace and a founding member for, um, of the Pakistan-India Forum for Peace and Democracy. Um, he writes extensively in Indian and foreign journals and is a regular political commentator in print and electronic media. He has written on uh, third world aspirations, nationalism, Kashmir and prospects for peace, Indian foreign policy, India-US relations or India-US nuclear relations. Um, he has also authored uh, very fundamental reports on human rights violations in Kashmir, on ethnic cleansing in Gujarat, um, has been in trouble a few times because of this, uh, but remains um, a strong uh, supporter of human rights and democracy in his country and abroad. Um, he's also the, uh, the co-author of a book called Maoist and the Other Armed Conflicts uh, from uh, Penguin in 2010. Um, without further ado, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, my apologies to all those who don't know English, but unfortunately English is the only foreign language I know. Um, I first want to briefly interrogate the Russian Revolution and its impact on the Global South, and then from there take what lessons I think um, uh, are requ required. Of course, being an academic in a communist party is sometimes a, con a contradiction in terms, but since I've lasted out since 1973, Obviously, either they or I have learned something. Maybe both. Now, one major point not made sufficiently about the Russian Revolution was that it did not run true to type. As you would know, that the entire argument of Lenin was for the February Revolution, given their calendar, then going over to the October Revolution. But later when um, Lenin examined the Russian situation, he said, no, there is actually going to be an April thesis, as he called it. And he said the revolution could be preponed to April. And so the revolution actually came to be. Of course, even after the revolution, there were wars of intervention by some 14 countries to overthrow the regime. But it did lead to a number of questions. Number one, two of the uh, Politburo stalwarts, Zinoviev and Kamenev, were extremely worried about Lenin's supposedly premature action. They even went to the extent of leaking the date of the revolution. This Lenin, in his later writings of 1922 and 1923, the so-called Lenin, Lenin Testament forgave. But the Italian theorist Antonio Gramsci actually called, called the revolution a revolution against capital and a revolution that was not based on capital, on, on the great text that Marx built, but showed that uh, you could not have a, a strictly followed kind of revolution. 
Incidentally, a number of his colleagues, including Palmero Togliati, were a bit skeptical about this. But they showed that uh, there were serious theoretical problems uh, in the sense of expecting a revolution of all things to have a particular timetable. And there was nothing wrong in what Gramsci did by saying that it was not following capital, which after all was largely a work of political economy and not uh, a work for overthrowing the Tsar. There was another debate between Leon Trotsky and Antonio Gramsci, where Trotsky, seeing the war of intervention, and he was a builder of the Red Army, he wanted to liberate the neighboring countries to buy space for the revolution to stabilize. But Gramsci realized that it might not work that way, and it might uh, lead to the Russians handling what that they could um, deal with. So Gramsci, writing under censorship in jail, warned against the war of maneuver, which he said the permanent revolutionary thesis of Trotsky would be. And he should in, instead fight for a war of position, which was like a trench war, where you build from fortification to fortification and slowly moved up. Um, also, it must be noted that um, Gramsci kept watching the revolution very carefully. Even before he was arrested in 1927, he asked Palmiro Togliati to uh, take a letter to the Politburo where he said that this, uh, this arguments between in the Politburo, especially between Stalin and Trotsky and others, were not good for the revolution. As it happened, Togliati did, Togliati did not give the letter. He thought it might cause problems with the Italian party and the Bolshevik party. Now, they, what is often not been realized is the role that this revolution played for the global south, at that time called the third world or worse. Um, a, not, a notable characteristic of Bolshevik rule, of course, led to this, because it was its support to the many small, medium, and big nationalities in the Soviet Union, what were later called Soviet Central Asia. And Lenin, in his writings before and after the revolution, men mentioned that the outcome of the revolutionary struggle abroad would be determined by the nature of liberation movements in India, China, etc., which had already started. Zinoviev, in his address to the peoples of the East, at the Communist International Comintern in Baku, 1920, stated, Brothers, we summon you to a holy war in the first place against British imperialism. Because British imperialism was the most dangerous imperialism in a large part of the world, as both, the, both of us here know from our own experience. Uh, but also, Lenin understood this. And he said, in the last analysis, the outcome of the struggle will be determined by the fact that Russia, India, China, etc. account for the overwhelming majority of the population of the globe. And during the last few years, it is this majority that has drawn, been drawn into the struggle for emancipation. <clears throat> the Soviet also did reach out to regimes which were not like their own. So, for example, as Nikolai Bukharin said, if we propound the solution of the right of self-determination for the colonies, we lose nothing by it. On the contrary, we gain, for the national gain as a whole will damage foreign imperialism. Now, what did they mean by the right of self-determination? A right of a country to make its own political choice of how it would grow, how it would, what paths of independence it would take, what kind of government it might have. For example, uh, seeing what is happening in Europe now, where there would be a federal government, or more than a federal government, or less than a federal government. This, Lenin also, like the other Bolsheviks, distinguished between imperialist wars, that is, which he, the wars of imperialism which he opposed, and the wars that supported national liberation which he called just wars. 
there were many post-revolution treaties of, of sex of this of secret treaties resolved with Eastern countries like Persia and Turkey. These were abrogated. In the League of Nations mandate system that was handed out to colonies of Germany and Turkey for protection by Britain, Australia and others, General Smuts, who was by the way later a South African, uh, and representing a Britain, stated in the League that quote, the German colonies in the Pacific and Africa are inhabited by barbarians who do not only, cannot only possibly govern themselves, but to whom it will be impracticable to apply any idea of political self-determination in the European sense. This, of course, was General Smuts, a great scholar of political theory and legal system, apparently unlike other generals. And uh, then um, Lenin pointed out about the mandate system, we see robbery, slavery, independent, independence, poverty, and starvation upon 1,250 million people by legal act. So in other words, the Bolshevik parties and their allies led by Lenin were very clear that the colony should be liberated. And they did not lay down any model. And sometimes there were costs. For example, um, the Soviets were quite aware as you know, we have pointed out, that communists are murdered in just a base manner in communist Turkey, as in social democratic bourgeois Germany. However, the communist international will continue its support in cases where really great revolutionary, perhaps half nationalist, revolutionary movements are in process, insofar as this movement is directed against imperialism. So the main problem and the main threat for the Soviet Union and for all peoples was seen as imperialism. But it did not talk of only one imperialism, but obviously with several imperialism. Lenin and his foreign minister Chicharin even gave support to Sun Yat-sen and his nationalist government in China in 1918. Later, Moscow sent Joff to establish relations with the nationalist Chinese government and clearly stated, quote, neither the communist is a joint statement, neither the communist nor the Soviet system can actually be introduced into China. Because there do not exist there the conditions necessary for the successful establishment of either communism or Sovietism. The pressing issue was national unification, independence, which the Soviet Union would support. Like this, the Soviets supported the independent government in Iran condemning British occupation and were critical of the Anglo-Iranian Treaty of 1919. A brief attempt by the new, uh, newly established party of Iran to overthrow the British failed and was uh, branded as adventurous by the Bolsheviks. Former relationships with Iran were established in 1921. And this continued. There was uh, another meeting of the people of the Eastern Baku where again uh, a lot of uh, support was given and uh, again, these Russians made their position clear. We say, quite frankly, that we support bourgeois nationalists. Bourgeois to the very marrow because Japan, America, and English imperialism is a most reactionary force. So sort of a national bourgeoisie as contrasted to imperialism. This was regardless whether they were bourgeois, character, democratic in character, or revolutionary. Uh, in, in the case of India, they supported Indian movements and in fact even gave advice. For example, in um, 1942, there was a struggle by um, the Indian um, movements, a lot of them, uh, for the Britain to leave uh, India. It was called Quit India. But 1942 was during the war effort of World War II. So the communists chose not to be to support um, any struggles uh, only if they could still support the war effort. But you cannot support the war effort of the British while you're asking the British to leave. And this uh, conundrum and the fact that communists can think in these convoluted ways 
not excluding some here, um, actually showed what Stalin pointed, pointed out to them when he went there, when the communists went there uh, in the 1940s and he, and, and, um, and he said that look you have to take your own country's requirements into, uh, into um, in one into uh, a context where you can put forward your views and you cannot put forward your views adequately if you oppose the government which is opposing the people. You cannot give priority to the war effort. Of course, there are also outstanding examples from Latin America of writers and intellectuals who fought against the struggles of imperialism. For example, Marquez, George Luis Borges, Carlos Fiantes, Losa, Otto René Castillo, who was killed by the Contras in, uh, in Central America. And um, as I argued by Anne Riding in the New York Times, that following the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, he wrote, Marxism became the new creed, and intellectuals its new priests. Now, I, instead of going on with this, uh, the, the, I'll be leaving the text here. Um, we also must look at the other side of the revolution. Now, the fact is uh, that number one, there were additions to theory. For example, Lenin developed this theory of democratic centralism to which Rosa Luxemburg and Leon Trotsky opposed very strongly. Democratic centralism means that uh, you have a larger body, then a smaller body which is smaller but has more powers because it's concentrated, and the smallest right on the top. Women, by the way, were seen by their small numbers. For example, one major woman leader in the Bolshevik party was uh, N. Kupskaya, who was Lenin's uh, wife. And even Rosa Luxemburg didn't have many uh, women with her in the uh, German Communist Party. Now, what also happened was, there, th this democratic centralism was taken up by Lenin along with his banning of factions and his um, dissolution of the Duma, Duma being the parliament, uh, based on certain um, uh, facts. Number one, contrary to the claim, the Bolsheviks were not Bolshoi, they were not the majority. As seen from the Duma vote, which led to the dissolution, it was the Mensheviks who were the Bolshoi. And the Bolshevik was actually uh, a minority, because of other things also, the war of intervention, etc. So, this was done to consolidate the revolutionary forces. But obviously in this kind of system it also hits at the free expression of free peoples, which was the slogan. Uh, but what happened as a consequence was that the party replaced the large mass, including of the other Soviets. And within the party, as Trotsky predicted, the Central Committee became more powerful, the Politburo even more powerful, and you had one person who Trotsky claimed would be um, Joseph Stalin. By the way, as all of you know, all these are pseudonyms. Uh, Trotsky's real name was David Brodenstein, he was a Jew, and Leon Trotsky was the name of his jailer. Which is an intriguing thing to do, but interesting. Uh, Likewise, Stalin, Lenin were both pseudonyms. Lenin was actually Ulyanov. Now, um, a terrible indictment of what happened to the revolution was, happened, was what happened after Lenin. So Lenin in 1922 and 1923 realized there were problems talking to Krupskaya and members of the Politburo. And he first suggested he praised all the people who were later going to be executed in the 1937 Moscow trials. 
He praised Bukharin as the most beloved theorist of the Soviets. He praised uh, Tomsky, he praised Zinoviev, he praised Kamenev. He said Trotsky was perhaps one of the most capable people in the Politburo, but too, took too much uh, time on administrative tasks. In before that, um, uh, about some months before that, he criticized Brzezinski um, and uh, Stalin for the way they handled the Georgian question. Both were Georgians. And as it letters went on, he tried to expand the size of the central committee so factionalism could be controlled, there would be enough people not to go into one or another faction. But in the end, uh, seeing that it was not working in January 1923, some days before he became totally paralyzed and, and could not talk, he wrote a letter to the central committee just before the party congress saying that Stalin is too rude in his behavior, which is not acceptable in a general secretary, and the party must find a way to remove him. Not that the party must remove him, but a party must find a way to remove him, because he knew it would not be easy. And it wasn't easy. Krupskaya did speak. Trotsky, for some reason, it was not his usual self. He probably thought the cause was lost anyway. And the others all praised um, um, Stalin very highly. And then um, after that, uh, there were the Moscow trials, where the uh, bulk of the Politburo was wiped out. Before that, any, doc any copy of this document that was circulated in the party congress was prohibited. And the price of having that document any time after the party congress was death. So, um, now there are some false stories about the Bosco trials. One of course is, there was certainly anything but fair trials. But in his very famous book, Arthur Kessler, in Darkness at Noon, argued that Bukharin willingly con uh, confessed as a last service to Stalinism. That's not true. In fact, what um, there were two things Bukharin was uh, scared of. One was his young family being annihilated. And the second was he wanted his manuscripts, which have come out now, uh, Philosophical Arab Arabesque and Socialism and Culture, which I think Ramshi, who criticized him, would have approved of if he had seen that document. Um, and his way of answering the prosecutor was not that of a, uh, of a criminal. He said, I, and this is from the archives, which came out only in 1988, thanks to Mikhail Gorbachev. Quote, I plead guilty to the sum total of crimes committed by this counter-revolutionary organization, irrespective of whether or not I knew of, or whether or not I took a direct part in, any particular act. So this is no confession. And this was covered up for many years. It was only when Mikhail Gorbachev took this up and a well-known study of Russia and of Bukhara in particular, Stephen P. Cohen, he went and got access to the archives and this is known. Now, what does this mean? Well, what it means is it gets worse. So, um, after the Bosco trials, um, before the war, two kinds of things happened. One was that people were sent, of course, to the gulags, apart from the executions, and the smaller nationalities were um, transferred from their homeland, um, nationalities like the Tatars, um, the um, Chenchens, the Kalmiks, all of them were transferred out. Stalin also tried to change the language because he didn't want any Turkic influence on the language because he was scared of Turkey destabilizing these nationalities, etc. And uh, also what he did was um, he went in for a pact with the R Germans called the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact. The original of that pact is missing. Uh, it is estimated that hundreds of thousands of documents were burnt by or at 
the behest of Joseph Stalin, and this pact was won. What it did was said there was a no war pact between the two. Now, this was happening around 1934 35 onwards, and it was at 36 onwards, you remember, 34 onwards, especially after 36, that the Spanish Civil War was on. But the Popular Front was destroyed by, by this document all over Europe, and also by Stalin's message to the communists to uh, decimate, if not destroy, the anarchists in the Popular Front. As for the damage, um, the hero of the Russian Revolution, Marshal Tukhashevsky, who was an advisor in the Spanish Civil War, told Stalin that, look, there are panzers that the Germans have. It's going to be tank warfare. It's not going to be the partisans on horseback as was the Russian Revolution. Stalin did not agree. He pressed. He was executed. Likewise, the admiral of the fleet who said that submarines were the coming war machine, they should be built up, he, he did not agree with Stalin. He was executed. According to Roy Medvedev, about 40 million people died in this. Um, Two million died in the Battle of Stalingrad, mainly because the Russians didn't have tanks and they were not adequately uh, prepared for the war. Um, 20 million at least died in the war as a whole. And about 19 to 25 million are seen as killed in the Dukulags and all that. So whatever the revolution was, after the death of, of uh, Lenin, it was not the same revolution. It had become reaction. That is not the line, by the way, in most communist parties. But some of us are slow in understanding the real truth. Now, a major distancing of from this is shown by the last meeting of celebrations in many countries for the October Revolution. In Russia, for example, Vladimir Putin and his group chose not to praise the revolution, but say it had its good points and its bad points. You can say the same about Putin. <laughs> and uh, or if you want a real friend, Erdogan. Because he comes from a country which has been colonized there. So, where is the revolution in terms of Marxism? Uh, there is Genedi Ryugunov and his party which uh, I don't advise you to read if you want to really read and learn about Marxism, unless you want to improve your Russian. And um, in China, there is Comrade Xi Jinping, who was threatening India with a border war, because India didn't agree to one belt, one road, which would allow the Chinese to cut through parts of India and uh, get to the Indian Ocean, etc. And of course, they're all, in China, they're all Marxists. I don't know whether they're marking Marxists or marking time Marxists or what, but this is not what Marxism is supposed to be. In the other countries, it is not quite so bad. But then this is the last major point I'm going to make. But the re-reading of Marxism the looking at texts that were not available, for example, from the economic and political manuscripts onwards, the Grundrisse, the new reading of people, that is being done a lot outside these countries, but not so much in these countries. Um, even the argument that is there one Marxism. There are two major Marxist parties in India, for example, the Communist Party of India, Marxist, within brackets, and Communist Party of India. There's really no difference between the two. One is slightly bigger. The two parties together are about 350,000, which you might think is a lot, but the population of my country is 1.2 billion. So it's not heck of a lot. So they do make some noise. So also, if one looks at the amount of work that has been done, on Marxism and the various impacts. For example, I think uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein has got it right when he says that there are a thousand Marxisms. And if you've read uh, 
a contemporary guide to uh, uh, a companion to contemporary Marxism by Jacques Bidet and um, uh, Stathis Kovalakis, uh, uh, Greek. I mean, they they make this point that uh, there are there is not just one Marxism, and not only that, there are uh, severe disagreements also on strategy, etc. So this idea that there is one kind of holy pope which has the understanding of what all Marxism should be is ridiculous. You know? And uh, secondly, after all, countries are different. National characteristics are different. People's languages are different. Their lifestyles are different. One thing, unfortunately, is not different in the Communist Party is uh, patriarchy. There are very few women. For example, in, uh, in the Communist Party, which I am in, uh, there is one woman in the Politburo, in the extended uh, body, which I have also been in, would be about three perhaps. And uh, the Communist Party of India Marxist, exactly the same. And it's not because there are no bright women. But it is not uh, uh, a pre you know, it's not something which is given uh, impetus. That is why the uh, communist uh, American communist singer Pete Seeger used to say, used to sing, that our leaders are great men, and we vote for them again and again. So every new central committee, our leaders are great men, and women will wait. We'll vote for the great men again and again. It might sound funny, unfortunately it's true. And that's tragic. Alright, then, about Comrade Lenin. Firstly, as I've indicated, Lenin's theoretical approach also is questionable. His theory of imperialism is wrong. Because he took the theory of finance capital from Rudolf Hilferding, from the German party then, and um, his theory of uh, export of goods being, uh, export of capital being more important than export of goods uh, from uh, Hosbaum and uh, Hobson and others. But, and he also said that there was an inevitability of wars under um, imperialism. Not true, that didn't happen. And as any number of people from Paul Baran, Paul Sweezy, and others have shown that finance capital never went from England. There was some finance capital from Germany. And no finance capital also did not go from the United States. Then democratic centralism I've already mentioned, that it's outmoded. Um, then also, the lack of deliberate teaching with autonomy given to not only the cadres but even in this uh, in the schools and the colleges at that time you can't have you know it's something like a bible or a talmud or a quran if you wish saying oh they say this resonates all right that's not the way the revolution works and it didn't work and despite lenin it didn't work after a while and you know, not to speak of other revolutions and the breakup for example, some years ago, we remember we were all supporting um, the Vietnam uh, resistance to the Americans. Well, some 10 years later, the Chinese attacked the uh, Vietnamese because the Vietnamese were pushing back the Khmer Rouge, the, uh, the Communist Party in Cambodia, which according to the Harvard study was responsible for one and a half million deaths. And yet China attacked Vietnam. So where is? the communist UMA or this one kind of communism. It's ridiculous because words are different in terms of intellectual ideas of the world. Theories are different. The world is diff going to keep changing. In that I would suggest that it is extremely important that uh, all progressive forces must unite at the very least exchange experiences and then find a way to work together. 
in India, we are under the lash of a Hindu right. Um, three students who were arrested for just a procession uh, last year in February were jailed for sedition. That is what Gandhi called the prince of all laws. It's an 1870 law. And uh, sedition is, uh, is equivalent to treason. And now, one year, six months later, their charge sheet is, is yet not ready. And uh, the media, including the electronic media and the newspapers, uh, a number of uh, right-wing political parties backed by neoliberalism, etc., are all attacking radicals and left, and even um, Democrats who are speaking openly. You know what all that means, what kind of tendency is rising. But the tendency is also rising because um, we in the left and in people's movements, we have failed to be able to bring as many people as we could, whatever um, the reasons. I've been an activist since 1969, when I was an undergraduate student in economics. And some of the economics of which I've just read out, I don't understand myself. But um, clearly, the, the, the need of the hour is for a maximum possible unity. Now, I'm not talking about a mechanical unity. I'm talking about a unity which in some ways is loose, but on important issues, unites. Because neoliberalism, number one, you know, this is a thing started, uh, earlier there used to be conservatives, then they became neoconservatives. Neo means sort of new, better. So now, liberalism, neoliberalism. I mean, uh, John Maynard Keynes, who was a liberal, would have been horrified to find that in the name of neoliberal, neoliberalism, this is what economists were doing. So I think that there is a need for grave re uh, rethinking. I'll just end with some comments. Number one, who should rethink? Well, I don't think we should re retain, and this is uh, sacrilegious for a lot, of, a lot of my friends, we should not think that people who are not Marxist cannot think and provide anything. For example, Michel Foucault, who was a post-structuralist, but a part, he, uh, as Jacques Bidet in his book, uh, Marx with Foucault wrote, apart from the earlier half of his uh, career, he was generally quite progressive. Of course, under the influence of André Glucksmann post-68, he did have a problem with uh, uh, criticizing neoliberalism, which he did not do, according to a number of authors. But there is Jacques Derrida, who inspectors, who inspectors of Marx, has looked at Marxism uh, more seriously, uh, was a student of Louis Althusser, the French Marxist. You have the openly, avowedly pro-Marxist uh, 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 Antonio Negri, who thanks to the Italian Communist Party and its uh, affiliated public prosecutor Pietro something, went to four years of, of jail uh, in Italy because the PCI was trying to get into a centrist alliance and Negri was an embarrassment. But his book Empire and his other books are useful, uh, so should be read. And likewise, uh, people like uh, Slavaj uh, Zizek, um, uh, people even Alain Badui, there's a whole host of new uh, theorists. We have to understand these people and learn from them. We cannot be sectarian, insular, nationalist about thought and theory. And that is what I would really like to plead. In my country, there's just a handful of us. But it can grow if more people write on these uh, theorists and try to get them forward. There are, of course, many more, especially more in various nations. But uh, this is the scenario we face. In India, we cannot say what will happen in the 2019 election. But we can pretty well say that if the ruling party manages to win easily, which it is also not going to be difficult to do because it has bought out the media, the electronic media, 
the print media, we cannot write on it, or we are uh, very niggardly put on the electronic media, on TV, um, where the big bourgeoisie and the petty bourgeois are all with the government. That, that is part of neoliberalism. So we are facing difficult times. But, um, and I don't want to, you know, use the joke of, a serious joke, of the, of the Spanish Civil War, where uh, towards the end there was the joke that we had, we lost all the great battles, but we had all the good songs. Um, we should be able to find our way out of uh, this situation. I don't think it's a problem only of India. Pakistan is in trouble. Bangladesh is in trouble. Myanmar with the Rohingyas, etc. They're in trouble. In Sri Lanka, they have refused federalism to the minority Tamils. South Asia, other parts of Asia, you know what's happening um, in the Philippines and other places. There is a real rightward shift. And a rightward shift is not going to go from us alone, but it will have to be a collective decision. I'm sorry for um, uh, exceeding my time, but um, I do thank you for coming after lunch and uh, being stoic enough to listen to all this. Thank you.